Good evening. Good to see everyone here again tonight. I want to welcome back our visitors. I'm glad to have you with us. This evening's lesson is entitled, How Long, O Lord? Taking our text from Habakkuk, chapters 1 through 3. Pretty much the book of Habakkuk. I don't know how many of you, as I pointed out on Wednesday night, felt like Habakkuk this past week. This past week had a high-profile case that seemed to be a gross miscarriage of justice. And I don't want to get into the politics of it. The unfortunate thing is that our justice system has become politicized, as well as many other areas of our lives. It's hard to separate the two. But rather than get into the politics, just dealing with the justice case alone, a high-profile case that basically came down to saying... The law only applies to certain people. It doesn't apply to all. And so, as I was dwelling on those things and trying to figure out a way to kind of vent my frustration, I found myself turning to the book of Habakkuk and spending a lot of time looking and seeing and remembering that in Habakkuk's time, it wasn't any, any different. And in fact, it might have even been more grievous because of what laws were being perverted and who they were. But throughout time, Righteous people see the immorality, they see the injustice and the oppression among them, and they often lament such conditions before God. This has been the way it has always been. Habakkuk learned that God's answers to such sins are not necessarily the answers that, rather the righteous or unrighteous, want to hear from God. The prophet Habakkuk stands out to me. He's different from the others that are called the minor prophets. Other prophets took the Lord's message directly to the people. As you look through the, the scriptures and you see that these prophets, whether they were considered the major prophets or minor prophets, it had nothing to do with whether they were better than another prophet, but the shortness or the length of their message. All these different prophets that were called, you see that they were called by God and they were sent for a particular purpose. Habakkuk stands out as different in that God did not call him, as far as what we read, he did not call him to take a message to the people. He's not told to write anything down until later. Habakkuk stands out because he took the complaint of the people directly to the Lord. He took his complaint and those of his brothers to God himself, wondering, how long, O Lord? And that's how, his, that's how this short book opens as he says it's an oracle or a burden of Habakkuk to God saying, How long, O Lord? Habakkuk was filled with troubling questions and he brought them to the Lord. His name in Hebrew means embrace or embraced by God. And that, comes, that becomes significant later on as he calls out to God, How long will you see violence and injustice? How long will you see these things and not respond? And then when God tells him what's about to happen... He says, well, wait a minute. How, how can you do such a thing? How can you use such a wicked people to punish us? And by the end of the book, or by the time you get to chapter 3, he has embraced God's message. And he says God will be his strength and refuge. His name in Hebrew means embrace or embraced by God. The date of his message is anywhere from 625 down to 605 B.C., probably a little further than that. Chances are he saw the destruction that was promised by God in his lifetime. We don't know the specifics. Not much other than this book is known of this man. But we do know in 625 B.C., Babylon declared her independence from Assyria. And if you go back in history, you see that Assyria and Babylon had a, a, about a thousand-year trade-off. One would oppress the other for a time, then the other would oppress the other for a time, and at this point in time, in 625 B.C., Assyria has been oppressing Babylon for a long time. They have been the world power dominating even Israel. They've been the world power throughout that their influence spread all the way to Egypt. In 625 B.C., that all changed. After a series of weak kings, Babylon declared her independence from Assyria. Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nabopolassar, he threw off the Assyrian oppression. He declared himself king of Babylon and he took his army with Nebuchadnezzar at his helm as his general and began marching west. And they crushed everything and everyone that came against them. In 612 BC, Babylon destroyed Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, prophesied by Nahum, but had not yet reached Judah. But a remnant of Assyria, the king was slain in 612 BC, defending his capital city. His brother and whatever remained of the army fled to Haran, where they put up a, a defense for three years. In 609, Haran fell. 
ending Assyria, and Assyria disappeared from the pages of history forever, never to come back as a world power. Josiah is killed in battle. King Josiah of Israel, of Judah, is killed in battle in 609 B.C. Pharaoh Necho is racing up through Megiddo in 609 B.C. to go on his way from Egypt to go aid Haran so it would not fall to the Babylonian horde. And as he went up through Megiddo, Josiah rode out to greet him, said, Stop! Necho said, I'm on a mission from your God. Josiah did not stop, and he was killed in battle. And that led a series of events of very weak and wicked kings over Judah. <clears throat> kings that did not seek God. Kings that had not made up their minds to seek and know who God was, as Josiah had done in his early years. And that set up the stage for the fall of Jerusalem. So the time period is anywhere in this time period that as God promises the Chaldeans would be the judgment on Judith. God not only paints a horrific picture of their destruction, but Habakkuk is well aware of it too. So it almost indicate that it happens after the world was watching as Babylon spread out like a plague from Babylon and conquered everyone and anything in their way and then turned their sights south into Judah. Habakkuk sees the wicked are prevailing inside and outside of Jerusalem. Powers of the world are shifting. There's uncertainty in Jerusalem's future. And he cries out to God. He asks three questions in essence. There are many ways it's, it's worded, but if you break it down in Habakkuk chapter 1, 1 to 4. I want you to read that with me real quick. Habakkuk chapter 1, 1 to 4. It says, The oracle, Lord, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet saw. How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore the law is ignored, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore justice comes out perverted. Habakkuk asks, why do the wicked flourish? You know, the pictures I had on here were of blind justice. All going all the way back at least to the Greeks, the idea of justice was she was Lady Justice. She was blind. Her scales ought to be balanced. She holds in her hand a sword because it is impartial. Justice does not matter who you are, what background or class or status you are from. Justice is just that. It is justice for all. It does not matter who you are. And so justice is to be blind. Going all the way back to the Greeks, they personified justice with this form of a woman with a blindfold holding a sword and balanced scales. And they even deified her and gave her a name and made her one of their pantheons of gods. But the idea has, stu has stayed with us even into our nation. You go to our nation's capital on the Supreme Court, there's Lady Justice with the blindfold on, the balanced scales and the sword standing over the courthouse. And many courthouses throughout our land have this picture of justice that is blind, that justice does not matter how much money or power that one might wield. Justice is for all, and yet, the kind of justice we're seeing today, not just this past week, but in time, recent times, going back decades, is that justice is very partial. It is not impartial. It seems wickedness runs rampant in any time period. And here in the U.S., we're experiencing and seeing it spread across the globe. Political, cor political corruption. The murder of innocent babies. I found this website that keeps a running tally of reported abortions. So this number is a lot higher. This is the reported abortions from the year 1973 till now. It's 58,586,256. On that statistic, it gave in the, a statistic for 2014 that said the number in 2014 alone indicated two babies were lost every minute throughout that year. This is not a global number. This is the number in our country alone since Roe v. Wade in 1973. So how we see political corruption. We see the murder of babies and it's been politicized to the point that no one wants to take a stand one way or the other because someone's going to be offended. And so justice has been politicized. The sexual immorality are paraded and celebrated and held up as the norm rather than the exception. Protesters throughout the land hold up signs stating marriage predates Christianity. It's not yours to define. That's right. It's not ours to define. God defined it. Jesus said in Matthew 19 that it was this way from the beginning that male and female become husband and wife. They're not trying to define it. 
they're trying to redefine it. We're not against defining it, we're against redefining what this word means and the institution that it is. And our president celebrated the court last year, June 26, 2015, for the Supreme Court of our land struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, allowing same-sex marriage in all 50 states, regardless of any state's laws that they had on the books. And our president celebrated by ordering the color struck up in rainbow, a perversion of something beautiful and glorious and a promise made by God in Genesis 9 to indicate something immoral and deviant. And he ordered our capital lit up with those colors in support of the Supreme Court striking down the Defense of Marriage Act. And it's sad that we even needed a Defense of Marriage Act in our land. It's sad that we had to have that in the first place. And it's further sad that a rogue set of judges decided that they would legislate from the bench and strike down a law. Habakkuk's next question is, is there no justice? Just as it seemed justice was perverted then, in a nation under God's laws, the law of Moses, we see our nation, a nation built on the rule of law, having justice perverted in such a blatant and public way. From courts, the judges who legislate from the bench, I just pointed out June 26, 2015 will always be emblazoned in my memory, just as I'm sure it was when people could not believe in 1973 when Roe v. Wade was passed. To the FBI not filing charges against Hillary Clinton, July 5th, 2016, for violating Section 793F of the Federal Penal Code, Title 18, in acting, as they pointed out, with gross negligence in her handling of classified information and lying about it. In FBI Director James Comey's statement on July or Tuesday, July 5th, he declared there would be no charges. He, in that declaration of no charges, he spelled out at least seven items she was guilty of that would end in felony charges if she had been anyone else, saying she was extremely careless and exhibited a gross negligence in the handling of classified documents. He actually said if anyone else tries it, they won't get off, but she did because she didn't mean to do it. Many lawyers have been writing papers ever since Tuesday saying this guy rewrote the federal law allowing for intent. The law says it must be prosecuted if negligence is demonstrated. He said she demonstrated gross negligence, but he says she didn't mean to do it. Do you see the can of worms that that opens? Silly Americans, laws are for poor people. Laws are only for people that don't have the name Clinton. Laws are only for people that don't have the money to send their husband to talk to the attorney general at an airport in a private meeting to get her off. And again, this is not about politics. This is about justice. Justice was mishandled. Justice was perverted. And not only that, not, not only Americans were watching this, but countries the world over were watching this. And as, he te as James Comey testified before Congress on Thursday, he admitted to six counts that she had lied. But here's what he said in his statement on July 5th. He said, and this is, I, I know it's difficult to read up on the far right, so I'm going to read it for you. He said in his closing argument, To be clear, this is not to suggest that in similar circumstances, a person who engaged in this activity would face no consequences. To the contrary, those individuals are often subject to security or administrative sanctions. But that's not what we're deciding now. When the law is not upheld, it causes confusion. It causes confusion when one law applies to someone, but it does not apply to others. And justice is partial rather than impartial. There are other pictures that I found that I didn't want to bog us down with saying, why follow the laws? What handed down Tuesday made a lot of other people with security clearance saying, then why follow the laws? simple answer for Christians is because God says we are to do so. It doesn't matter what everyone else does around us, we are to follow the laws of the land so that we are not prosecuted as lawbreakers. It does not matter what else anyone else does around us. And just to point out, others have not been so lucky for less. General Petraeus had to resign and pay $100,000 in 2012 after he passed sensitive information to Paula Broadwell, who was his mistress and biographer, and he lied about it and the lying about it was a felony in and of itself. And they didn't charge him with the felony. They charged him the $100,000 fine instead of the felony, but they forced him out of the military. He was a four-star general with a promising career, highly decorated. 
And because he lied once, and he had passed on sensitive information, he lost his career, and he had to pay a $100,000 fine. Edward Snowden, in 2013, became a fugitive after he leaked classified information about the NSA surveillance program to the public, despite what you might think of Edward Snowden. And there are, he's a polarizing character. Many have hailed him as a hero. Many have hailed him as a traitor. And he was found to have violated the Espionage Act. He fled the country to avoid decades in prison, and he was branded a traitor. In fact, after he fled the country to avoid decades in prison, Hillary Clinton herself referred to him as a traitor who has, quote, blood on his hands for his leak of classified documents. And yet the FBI found that she had hand mishandled 110 classified documents. I don't know how many Snowden released, and it doesn't really matter the amount, whether it was one in the case of the general, whether it's a hundred, whether it's a thousand. The law states they ought to hold no office. They are to be stripped of their, whatever their position is. They lose their security clearance. They're to hold no office in the United States, and yet she's held up by one side of our government, by one side of our political party in our country as their top, as their top presidential candidate. Just as Habakkuk asked, I can't help but ask, how long will God leave? How long will God leave? Habakkuk was concerned with time. We might as well be too. How long will God see and hear and stay his hand of justice? In times of uncertainty and rampant injustice, let us, like Habakkuk, take our questions to God. He said, How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, and yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore the law is ignored, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore justice comes out perverted. As we look in the time that Habakkuk lived, the laws that he's saying came out perverted, these were God's laws. This was a nation not set up by men. This was a nation set up by God, brought out of Egypt by a powerful and mighty hand. And their whole government, from the peasant to the king, were required to keep this law. So when Habakkuk cries out that the law is ignored, justice is perverted, think about what laws come out perverted. Yeah, we are a nation that has long since thrown off any, any sense of following after God. But we have been a nation for the last 240 years, a nation that has been founded upon the principle of the rule of law. And yet, in the last several decades, we have seen law thrown out and mishandled. And so the question that we ask is the same that Habakkuk asked. How long, O Lord? How long will we call for help? How long will we have to wait why does Habakkuk's question was, why does the evil in Judah go unpunished? We might ask the same. We see rampant wickedness in the U.S. So much so that now even in kindergarten, they're teaching gender identity issues. Hopefully in the next coming weeks, I'm putting a lesson together on that, to address that issue. What is our response to these things? The fact is, they're taking a confused kids and confusing them further, rather than giving them the black and white answer that has always been there. And so we are confusing people. There's rampant wickedness in the U.S. Habakkuk laments over the apparent rule of wickedness and violence. He wonders why God allows it or is indifferent to it. Just this past week, mass shootings and suicide bombers. Just this that last week, mass chaos going on in Dallas. As people attacking police officers who are serving and protecting. Habakkuk states justice is perverted. So in a situation such as that, where can one turn to? When justice comes out perverted, who can you turn to for justice? Habakkuk went to the only person you can't turn to. That was God. He said, how long, O oh Lord? We see justice perverted daily in our own nation. Sometimes we, we want to ask the same question. Where can you go then for justice? If laws only apply to certain people and not to the rest, where can we turn to? How will we get an unbiased and impartial judgment? I want us to read Psalm 73, starting at verse 1. Look at me over in Psalm 73. Asaph grappled with some of these same questions that Habakkuk would grapple with later. 
And this just goes to show us that it doesn't matter the time period. Whether it's the king is David, whether the king is Solomon, whether the king is one of Josiah's sons, the problem is justice is not always impartial. Because justice is meet in human judgment, justice is meted out by humans. And humans can be bribed. Humans can make mistakes. And so Asaph wonders how long God will wait. He wonders, why should he do what's right when everyone else seems to be doing what's wrong and prospering over it? Notice his problem he grapples with, starting in verse 1. Psalm 73, it says, A psalm of Asaph. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace, the garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness, the imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore his people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, How does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease. They've increased in wealth. Notice what he's saying. He says in verse 2, My feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. What is he saying? I almost bought the lie that the wicked truly are prospering. I almost bought the lie that I could do what everyone else around me is doing. But I want you to see what his conclusion is. He says, Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. He says, These are the wicked. They're always at ease. They've increased in wealth. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Why have I done what's right when everyone else around me seems to do what's wrong and prosper? But then he says, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children, speaking to God. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived therein. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Asaph grappled with the same problem Habakkuk gets. And just as Asaph came to that conclusion himself, God is about to give Habakkuk that same conclusion. We don't know God's plans. We don't know how close judgment is. But one thing that we do know, just as God's answer to Habakkuk is judgment is coming soon, in verses 5 to 11, we know judgment will come for all men. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says that there will be a judgment, that he will judge the secrets of all men and the things that they have done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, All men will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be rewarded or recompensed for their deeds in the body, whether good or bad. That means there is a judge. And it will perhaps be the only time judge, judgment is meted out with that type of impartiality is when we stand before God. And it does not matter what we have gotten away with, the things we thought we got away with. Judgment will be sure and it will be steadfast. God responded to Habakkuk, warning him he was about to do something that would cause the ears of all who heard it to tingle. God said he was doing something unimaginable. He would raise up the Chaldeans to invade the land and punish Judah. And he described the Chaldean forces in terrifying images. People that just rake through the land, taking whoever they choose and carrying them off to do with as they please. Babylon is broken away from Assyria. It's questing for world power. The nations around see it. Even Pharaoh in Egypt said, we have to stop their advance at Haran, else the rest of the world is going to fall at Nebuchadnezzar's feet. But God had already said through Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar's got it all. God said, Nebuchadnezzar is my instrument for wrath and destruction and judgment, not just on Judah, but all the nations. All along the coast from Tyre and Sidon all the way down into Egypt. Taking away Moab and Ammon and Edom. Everyone is going away into captivity. But a remnant of Israel will return after 70 years. God is telling Habakkuk his plan. That he's going to use the Chaldeans to his own advantage. 
and to punish his people. They are a violent nation. They will execute God's judgment. And what God says about them is that they're going to arrogantly think that they're serving their own purpose. And yes, even serving their own gods. And yet God is saying, I'm in control of it all. And I'm sending them to you. How would you like that as your answer? To say, how long, O Lord? Maybe you would have wanted to dwell on a little more bliss. But God's answer was judgment was coming. And then Habakkuk's next question starts in chapter 1, verse 12, and it goes all the way through 2, verse 1. And I have on the slide behind me, verse 13. He says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? He just described the treacherous were in Jerusalem in positions of power and judgment. But now he's saying, They're more treacherous than us. He says, how can you show favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? He just described how justice is ignored and comes out perverted among God's own laws, God's own people. And he says to God, how can you use someone to destroy someone more righteous than they? You know, Israel got their wish time and again, whether it was the northern ten tribes swallowed up by Assyria or Judah about to be swallowed up by Babylon. They looked like the other nations. They looked and they behaved like the other nations. Just as they wanted, going back to 1 Samuel chapter 8, when they called out to Samuel, give us a king to rule over us like the other nations. We want to be like everyone else. We're tired of standing out because we have judges whenever we're in trouble. Well, if they would have followed God's law, they wouldn't have been in trouble. It wouldn't have been a roller coaster ride of evil and blessings and curses throughout the book of Judges. But they said, they cried out to Samuel, Give us a king. And God said, Do it. Give them a king. Let them see what kind of request they have made. Making the old adage, Be careful what you ask for, come true. And as Habakkuk just asked, We need to be careful. We need to be careful what we ask. Here he's asking, how long will you wait? So his question, going in verse 12 all the way through chapter 2 and verse 1, is how can a just God use Babylon, who is wicked and more ungodly than Judah, to punish Judah, which is more righteous than Babylon? Habakkuk responded with confidence that God will not entirely destroy his people, while recognizing the Chaldeans as a means of judgment upon Israel. In verse 12, in Habakkuk 1 and verse 12, he says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge. And you, O Rock, have established them to correct. He's saying, surely you've sent them to judge and to correct, but we're not going to be wiped out. No, Jeremiah promised that they would not be wiped out. Look with me. Place your marker there in the back end. And turn with me to Jeremiah 25. God did make this promise to the nation of Judah that there would be a remnant. 25 verse 11 he says this whole land will be a desolation and a horror and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years then it will be when 70 years are completed I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation declares the Lord for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and I will make it an everlasting desolation I will bring upon that land all my words which I pronounced against it all that's written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations And then he talks about all the different nations that will be swallowed up by Babylon. This judgment was not just on Israel. All the land was going to suffer God's wrath. Then look at Jeremiah 29. Over in Jeremiah 29 and verse 10. He says, For thus says the Lord, When seventy years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. He says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. He goes on to say, I will be found by you. A remnant would return after 70 years. But Habakkuk says in verse 13, God is of purer eyes than to see wrong. Why do the wicked swallow up the righteous? This was happening in a land that was supposed to follow after God's laws. Not just any nation's laws, but after God's laws. And in verses 14 to 17, he says, God made the fish of the sea, caught by others who then 
God made man as the fish of the sea, caught by others who then offer sacrifices to the net. He's saying, God made man, and when they're in trouble, they're offering sacrifices to the net that caught them, not God that made them. And he says, why will the nations be killed forever? This is one of those scenarios that we need to be careful what we ask for. Be careful what you ask for. You may not like the answer is the way the old adage goes. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you ask for. It may that you may not like the answer. Habakkuk did not like the answer that God gave. I'm bringing these terrifying Chaldeans. Terrifying. They're brutal in combat. They're cruel to be cruel. And I'm bringing them in destruction and judgment and correction for you. He doesn't like nor understand God's answer. But I want you to read what his response is in chapter 2 and verse 1. After hearing God's answer, he says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I'll keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. He doesn't like or understand God's answer, but he declares he would stand at the watch post to hear God's answer to his complaint. The answer to Habakkuk's question, how long, O Lord, was that judgment was coming soon. And judgment was going to be terrifying. The next section we want to see is God's answer to Habakkuk was, the righteous will live by his faith. In Habakkuk 2, 2 through 4, it says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. God is saying what Jeremiah said. If you want to live, you need to bend the knee to Nebuchadnezzar. He's telling Habakkuk to write this down so people can avoid the judgment. They might know what to do. Now is when God tells him to write it down. So, in verse 3, For the vision is yet for the appointed time. So it's not. this has not happened yet. It hastens toward the goal and it will not fit. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay he says, don't get complacent. Don't think that a couple years have gone by and nothing has happened. Know that Babylon is coming. And they're coming for judgment. He says, don't, don't think that just because it hasn't happened yet, that it's not coming. He says, wait for it. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous will live by his faith. Just as Habakkuk had to learn the righteous will live by his faith, we see this quoted many times in the New Testament or summarized in a, in a certain way as we see in Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to talk about that later. The point is, just as Habakkuk was told the righteous will live by his faith, no matter what everyone else is doing, that's pretty much the answer to us today. The righteous will live by his faith. The proud or the arrogant are not upright, but the just will live by faith. God's answer to Habakkuk rings throughout the New Testament writings. Look with me in Romans 1 and verse 17. Place a marker there in Habakkuk. Come back to it for chapter 3. But look with me in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. We remember verse 16 very well. That's where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, what is the it? It is the gospel that he's not ashamed of in verse 16. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. Look with me in Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3 in verse 11. He says, however the law is not of faith, on the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Giving uh, the righteous, who he, another literal translation of that says, but he who is righteous by faith shall live. Again, quoting from Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. Look in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 38. You can actually back up all the way to verse 32 to get the full context. The Hebrew writer is talking about people who are distressed. They were being imprisoned. Their property was being seized. But he says to them in verse 37, For yet in a little while he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we're not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Here was a time period that justice was being perverted for Christians. They had done nothing wrong but be a Christian, a follower of Christ. And they were being imprisoned. 
and their property was being confiscated. And yet the Hebrew writer is telling them, now is not the time to throw away your confidence, going back to verse 35. He says, you have a great reward if you do not shrink back. If you do not throw away your confidence, if you don't shrink back, but if you have that preserving of the soul. Habakkuk is to write down God's words on tablets that it could be read and that others could respond to it. God's answer in Habakkuk 2, 5-19, just to highlight God's answer here, is that God will judge the proud, as he said in verse 4. He says, Woe to the proud possessed with the lust of conquer and plunder. Verses 5-8. to eight. These are things he's talking about Babylon. Remember what we read in Jeremiah 25, 11 and onward? That when that 70 years is completed, God would exact justice on Babylon itself? This is why. These are the people that are going to conquer Judah. He says, Woe to the proud possessed with the lust of conquest and plunder. Chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. In verses 9 to 11, he says, Woe to their efforts to build a permanent empire through cruelty and godless gain. Woe to those who build cities with bloodshed. In verses 12 to 14. Woe to those who cruelly treat those they conquered. In verses 15 to 17. God had a law that was in place even for the Israelites of a way to treat prisoners of war. And yet Babylon didn't have any such laws. They didn't. They did whatever they felt was right. They were, they were the conquerors. And God says, Woe to those who cruelly treat those they conquered. And in verses 18 to 20, Woe to those who practice idolatry. They're going to come against Judah, and they're going to think that they're doing it from their own might, their own power, and for their own gods. And God is saying, I'm in control. I'm pulling the trigger. I'm the one that has sent them. We remember in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, or I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar is troubled by his second dream that's recorded for us. And Daniel gives him the meaning of it and says, you're going to be removed from the kingdom for seven years. And Daniel is in tears. And he says, king, whatever it is, you need to repent of it. And 12 months go by. A year after that, there's Nebuchadnezzar standing out on his balcony looking over Babylon and he says, Behold, great Babylon that I have built by my might, by my power, for my majesty. And at that moment, as those words came out of his mouth, he was driven from mankind to live in the fields as a beast. Now he literally had his name on that city. As that city has been excavated, they have found every other brick was inscribed with King Nebuchadnezzar's name. So his name literally was on that city. But he didn't do it by his own power. He didn't do it by his own might. He didn't do it for his own majesty. He did it because God said, I'm giving all the land, man and beast, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. That is the only reason. And Nebuchadnezzar only came out of that field after seven years when he recognized that God gives to mankind the rulership and he can take it away. Nebuchadnezzar came to realize what many in power today need to also realize. God has put them there. And just as he has put them there, God can remove them. And what a scary thing it is when God decides to remove them. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 20, God says he is in control. Let the earth be silent before him. In Habakkuk 2 and verse 20, he says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. It's kind of a chastisement to Habakkuk. He didn't have to answer Habakkuk. From as far as we know, he didn't answer Asaph when Asaph cried out, Why is this happening? He didn't have to answer Habakkuk and tell him what was going to happen. He had already revealed that to Isaiah when Hezekiah allowed the emissaries from Babylon to come in and look at everything in his house and temple. He had already prophesied Babylon was going to be the instrument of destruction way back then. He's already prophesied it through Jeremiah. And now Habakkuk is seeing all this going on, this rampant wickedness. He didn't have to answer Habakkuk. But he did. He chose to let Habakkuk know exactly what was going to happen to Judah. And he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. What he's saying is, just as Job had to recognize, we don't have the right to question God. We don't have that right. We might cry out because it's our, it, we do have the ability as his children to come to him and lay on him any burden or care that we have. And we can cry out as Habakkuk did, how long, O Lord, but we need to be ready to accept the answer, whatever that answer might be. Mm. Mm. 
the wickedness appears to go unpunished. God says the righteous will live by their faith and know that God is in control. We can look in Proverbs 19.5 and verse 9 and see that liars will be punished. Wickedness will be punished. Naaman 1, 2 through 3 is reference that Babylon will be punished. The wicked only seem to go unpunished as God is ready to judge the living and the dead for their deeds. 2 Corinthians 5.10, 1 Peter 4.5, Revelation 20 and verse 12, where John got to see this judgment scene happen at the throne, where it says the small and the great didn't matter their power, didn't matter their money, didn't matter how in poverty they were. There is no excuse that can be given when we stand before that righteous judge. The living and the dead will be judged. God will use Babylon to punish Judah, but then he'll also punish Babylon for its wickedness. You see, justice doesn't go ignored by God. Justice would fall on Babylon just as it was used to punish Judah for its injustice. God would use judgment. The last thing that Habakkuk tells us in chapter 3 is that the Lord God is my strength. Chapter 3 is a petition for God's mercy and action. It's written in the form of a psalm or a song. Look at me in Habakkuk 3.1. It says, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigionoth. Shigionoth means, it's Strong's 80, uh, Hebrew 7692 in the Hebrew dictionary. And Shigionoth means a rambling poem or something set to music. And in fact, in verse 19, says, For the choir director on my stringed instruments. So yes, it was a prayer, but it's a prayer in the form of a psalm or a rambling poem. Something that was set to music. And it's praise for God's past deliverance. The prophet praises God for past deliverance, as in verses 3 to 7. He brought, God brought judgment to the wicked and the salvation to his people in verses 8 to 15. And it's a great profession of faith. After knowing full well what's coming to Judah, after seeing what Babylon could do to the cities and the nations around him, what he did to Assyria in a very short order, order of time, and as he points his arrow southward to come into Judah, Knowing all these things are going to take place. Habakkuk says this in verse 16. I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones and in my place I tremble. Because I must wait quietly for the day of distress. For the people to arise who will invade us. He's saying just as God said it would happen, it will happen. He has no doubt of that. His faith is such that he says, I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. He says when he heard what God's answer was, it says he trembled in his inward parts. At the sound of it, his lips quivered. He's, he's trembling. This is a frightful prospect of judgment. But then here's the part that is applicable to all of us still today, and that's in verse 17. I want you to see the statement of faith that he makes. He says, though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines. Though the yield of the olives should fail and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he has made my feet like pine's feet and makes me walk on my high places. And says this was for the choir director on string ministry. In light of what he knew his people were to suffer. This is exactly what God meant. When God said back in chapter 2 and verse 4. The righteous will live by his faith. You can catch what he's saying there in verses 17 and 19. Though calamity happen. Though there's not prosperity. Though the land suffer. He says I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Not man. Man will always fail us. Our strength ought not to be in our justice system. Our strength ought not to be in our nation. Our trust ought to be in God. If there is any person at any time period that trust ought to have been in a nation, you'd think it was the people that lived under the kings of Judah and Jerusalem. You'd think that their trust could be in the laws of God and those who swore to uphold them. you think their trust could be in their leaders. No, it wasn't. Not even in that time period. Habakkuk says it doesn't matter what goes, around, what goes on around him. No matter how terrifyingly cruel the people are that come for judgment. He says, the Lord God is my strength. He is what holds me up. 
no matter what we might face in this nation. Whether judgment is a year from now, 200 years from now, God is our strength. Our trust ought not to be in man because we will be disappointed each and every time. But we need to have the faith that's back. That's the kind of faith we're to have today. Faith in God caused Habakkuk to go from trembling to a song. He went from trembling and tears to a song. Habakkuk looked to God for salvation from the wicked and he came to recognize him as the God of his salvation. And Habakkuk 1, 2, and 3 and verse 18. We can take our burdens or questions to God. 1 John 5, 14 to 15. Look with me in these short passages that we're going to look as we make application. In 1 John chapter 5, 14 to 15. We, like Habakkuk, can go to God. And we can see the injustice around us. We can see the rampant immorality and wickedness taking hold of our culture. And we too can cry out, How long, O Lord? He says, This is the 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence which we have before Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from Him. We can go to God and we can tell Him our burdens. We can take to Him our questions. And as God revealed to to Habakkuk, judgment would come against the wicked from a terrible and hostile nation. And then, judgment would come upon Babylon. As we read in Jeremiah 25, 12-14. You can also see it in chapters Isaiah 13-14. Isaiah is chapters 46-47. through Jeremiah 25, 12, all the way through 38. And Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51. Judgment was pronounced against Babylon. And here he told Habakkuk too. Kind of the consolation prize. Yeah, you're going to be wiped out. But don't worry, they're going to get theirs too. God's saying, justice does not go ignored when he's involved. Even though people think they're going to get away with it. Justice is not ignored. As we look through the book of Habakkuk, we might say, is this the way Habakkuk would like things for to take place? Perhaps, perhaps not. But it's the way that God chose. And Habakkuk knew well that it was best to continue to be righteous and to live by his faith. And just as Habakkuk said, I will wait to see how God responds. And then as Habakkuk said, my strength is in God, not in man. My strength and exaltation is in God. He is my strength. We must be ready to accept the answer. Just as Habakkuk said, I must wait until the day of distress when these people will arise to invade us. We need to have the answer. We need to be ready to accept the answer. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 9, Paul said he had a thorn in the flesh. And we don't know what that is. Many people have speculated all kinds of things. The bottom line is we don't know. Paul chose not to reveal it to us. The Holy Spirit, through Paul's hands, chose not to reveal it to us. The important part of that was that Paul had prayed about it to God three times. To have it removed, whatever it was. Whether it was something physical or something emotional. And Jesus' answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul says, so in my weakness of flesh, I will exalt and praise God. That ought to be our response. Paul was ready to accept the answer to his prayers. We need to be ready to accept the answers to ours. And it is that way among the people of God. We may observe injustice and wickedness around us. It didn't just happen this week. Our justice system has failed time and time and time again to those who are in power, to those who are are blessed with money. They seem to run the courts. And so we're going to observe injustice. We're going to observe wickedness around us. We might even want to see God's judgment happen, but we must be careful. God's judgments are terrifying, frightening affairs. In fact, we can read in Hebrews 10, 30-31, that it is terrifying to fall into the hands of the living God. It was terrifying in the days of Judah. It's been terrifying in the days since. It was terrifying for Israel in 70 AD, just as Jesus promised that Jerusalem would fall again. We know one day justice is coming. There will be a day of reckoning for all people by the most impartial judge the world will have ever seen. And it's terrifying to fall into the hands of the living God thing we need to know is that those who pervert justice will one day face the righteous judge. This is what happened with Felix as he was discussing these things with Paul. In Acts 24, 24 to 25, Paul says he was discussing with Felix righteousness, self-control, and you remember the next part? And the judgment to come. And Felix trembled.
trembled. Felix became frightened. If you look in secular history to understand, why did Felix tremble at that? Felix was the only man on record that we know of in Roman history that rose up from the ranks of a slave to hold the office of governor, answering only to Caesar. Historians at his time period, contemporary historians, were not kind to Felix. They said of him that he ruled as a king with the mentality of a slave. And if you get the full meaning of what those historians were saying, is he felt the world owed him. And so he took whatever he felt he deserved. And it didn't matter who he hurt. It didn't matter who he had to cheat, steal, or kill to get it. He felt the world owed him, and he only answered to Caesar. And so he was deserving of that. And if you think of what Paul was telling him about the judgment to come, is that one day he's going to stand before a judge. That not only that, but his boss, Caesar, is one day going to stand before a judge and be held accountable for the things that he has done. Yeah, Felix became frightened, and he trembled. In Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Jesus says he's going to return as a king. And he's going to gather all the nations before him. And John got to see this vision in Revelation chapter 20. He got to see how this has played out. And I want you to read verse 12 with me. It starts from verse 11 all the way through 15 as this judgment scene is seen. But in verse 12, it says, I saw the dead, the great and the small. The great and the small. There is no escape. He says, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. It does not matter how much power, how much money that they had, and what they thought they got away with, and even what they were acquitted with by men. They're going to stand and give an account for the things that they have done. Those who pervert justice will one day face the righteous judge. And perhaps that's the only consolation we might ever have in this life is to know that one day there is justice coming. But we need to have the faith of the back of it. We need to have the faith that regardless of the answer to our question, how long, O oh Lord, we need to live by our faith and seek righteousness and trusting ourselves to God no matter what a day may bring. Romans 1, 16 to 17, in it is the righteousness of God and the righteous man will live by faith. And Hebrews 10, 35 through 39, we're not those that shrink back to destruction, but of those with the preserving of our faith because we understand what 1 John 5, 4 says. Our faith has overcome the world. May God be our salvation and strength no matter our circumstances. Whether we have justice that is impartial or whether justice comes out perverted to whoever has the biggest bankroll, we need to understand there's coming a time that it does not matter who we are, we will stand before the throne. We will stand before God Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. And we'll get a, we're going to give an account of all the things that we have done. And for those who are Christians, the greatest blessing and reward we could ever ask for is found in Romans chapter 8. that says that Christ is our mediator. Christ stands not only in the judgment seat, but He stands between us and God on that day. No promise like that made to all the rest of the world, but to those who are children of God. Going back to verses 14 to 17 of Romans 8. If you're not a Christian tonight, you need to be to repent and be baptized into His name, knowing that it is in God that we must have strength. It is in God that we must put our trust and our faith, not in any other thing, not in any other institution or organization. Our strength and our trust must be in God. And if you are a Christian tonight, perhaps in error, not living the way that you should. Now is the time to make it right. While we draw breath, we still have the right to go to God in prayer and ask for forgiveness. And 1 John 1, 9 tells us He is faithful to forgive us our trespasses and bring us back into a state of righteousness before Him. And if we can assist you in any of these things, the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, come forward now while together we stand and while we sing.